Okay, hi, my name is Nate Lachtman. I am a healthcare lawyer and partner at the law firm of Foley and Lardner. I've been practicing healthcare law for about 13 years and eight years for telemedicine and telehealth. I chair our national telemedicine industry team. We have about a dozen lawyers dedicated to that practice. I think it's fair to say we do more of this work than any law firm in the country, probably the world, representing providers of uh, virtual care services. So it's uh, large hospitals, health systems, AMCs, um, and a ton of entrepreneurs. So we have, I do some software platform work, but really my heart and soul is uh, with the actual providers of the services. Happy to see a number of uh, our clients here in the audience today. And thank you uh, to VC and thank you to Milton for having me. So I'd like to take a little bit of time to share some information and answer any questions you might have. That's my Twitter handle. So I post all sorts of telemedicine law and business news. Uh, I would urge you to follow it if you want to see some of the breaking content. I'm also not a fan of, so right, I'm a lawyer and my job is to advise clients. Part of that is like information and knowledge, you know, uh, advice. I am not a fan of people who take, who, who are learned professionals and then they hold that information hostage saying, you know what, you have to hire me, you have to pay me, otherwise I'm not going to talk to you, I'm not going to give you any advice. It's not, that's just not the right way to be. So please, um, don't hesitate, you know, later today or or, or tomorrow, you can email or call. If you have a burning question, I am not going to tell you, you know, here, you know, please give me your credit card before I'm going to answer you this. Uh, I want to see the telemedicine industry grow and flourish. I really also want to see providers, particularly entrepreneurs, who don't have the same risk appetite, who don't have the same awareness of the bad things that can happen, um, and who frankly don't have the same budgets as the large AMCs. I want to see those entrepreneurs succeed. I want to see them scale their programs with confidence and with homogeneity in their operations as they go from state to state. If you have, for example, someone who tells you, you ask them the question, they say, you know what, what we're going to do first, uh, that's a nuanced, very complicated question, right? The law is a fickle mistress. And uh, let's first take a a sample of five to ten states and answer the question that way. That should be a sign to you that they have not done this across all states, that they have not yet figured out a solution for you, that it's going to be learning as they go along, and that should already be a red flag. So this is a, a, an inside joke on the hub and spoke model. It's like a pin, uh, pinwheel of legal issues with regard to telemedicine. My slides are a little bit content heavy for the 15 minutes I want to block on, but please take these home, steal these ideas, use them yourself, that's what they're there for. There's a number of handouts as well uh, in your uh, emailed materials, I'm sure VC will make them available. I have whole checklists, right, that uh, are in your handouts, how to go about procuring and negotiating your commercial in, in malpractice insurance coverage for telemedicine, how to manage your tort liability, here's a compliance checklist, look at those things. The fundamental rule for licensing, not to directly contradict some prior speakers, but it really is the location where the patient is at the time of the consult. That it governs the locus of care. That is the actus reus, if you will. That is where you need to have a license to practice medicine. So you certainly can negotiate with your carrier. They'll say, look, as long as you create a doctor-patient relationship in California, and then the patient is traveling temporarily in Florida, if you are sued for malpractice, we will cover you. That's one thing. If that patient sues in Florida and that carrier is not a licensed insurer in Florida, they will deny the coverage. They'll say, we don't have the obligation to do so. If the patient sues in Florida, the court will say, well, Florida law governs here and this is the venue and your agreement with your carrier, it uh, doesn't matter to us. If the patient files a complaint with the Florida Board of Medicine, the Florida Board of Medicine will not say, oh, okay, well, the patient is you know, a California resident, um, then it's not a problem. No, those will all be problems. So what you need to do is curate a network of licensed physicians or other providers that collectively you can match up to the proper patient. There are exceptions, of course, to everything. Follow-up care, bordering state. The most heavily utilized in telemedicine is the peer-to-peer -peer consultation exception. And we're going to talk about how that's applied in real-world business models. Here's the basic list of the telemedicine practice rules you need to know. Um, does anyone know the answer? Can you create a valid doctor-patient relationship via telemedicine with no in-person exam? Who said that? All right. You get a pair of pink socks. Give this man some clothing. Yes, you can. And you can in every state. Okay? The modality 
which is, which is the technolog technological conduit, whether it's real-time audio video or store and forward, differs. So some states say it has to be real-time audio video, but that's to create the initial doctor-patient relationship, right? No state is saying, hey, once, uh, you know, Milton and I have a doctor-patient relationship, I can't call him on the phone and ask him a question. No. We've already created our patient-doctor relationship. We can do more subsequent. So for tech purposes, you have greater flexibility to use async, to use messaging, to use telephone only after you've created the doctor-patient relationship. More and more entrepreneurs are looking to async. Anyhow, we see it in our clients. They say pure async. Okay? You can do that in a number of states, including prescribing, but you need to be aware of it. You need to map it out ahead of time have your legal uh, parameters and your workflow processes so then you can scale and you're not always on your heels as you get new business opportunities, whether it's a direct-to-consumer or if it's a B2B play. You need to come at it with confidence. Prescribing is the same way. There are some rules on controlled substance prescribing under federal law. I have an uh, article that's attached in your handouts. It explains it all to you, summarizes it. There's some medical record-keeping special rules or informed consent. Again, for our clients, what we do is we just have an informed consent form that uh, complies with every single state law informed consent rule. Okay, about like 20 some states have the rules. Just have a single form. You do not want to have a website, right, where the patient has to choose a different form, or heaven forbid, like your office manager is fumbling through the file to find Nebraska versus Oklahoma. There are some patient provider identification authentication issues. You know, how do you know this is the patient, right, the right patient? It's more complicated when you're doing async. There's some states have follow-up care requirements. Supervision of NPPs and MAs, this is going to be a hot issue because you want to leverage it. Know that supervision levels for incident two, um, or even some state practice, it's direct supervision, which means the doctor and the medical assistant or non-physician need to be in the same building or same campus, but not the same room. So if your telemedicine arrangement that you got this great idea in the shower and you're going to pitch it to a bunch of VC firms is predicated on the patient being at home and the medical assistant or non-physician practitioner being somewhere and the supervising doctor being in a third location, that's not going to work. In many states, it's going to be straight up illegal. And if you want to bill Medicare as an incident too, that's also not going to be prohibit, uh, permitted. So you really need to think through these things as you develop the economics of the business model in addition to the clinical processes. Look, I am not a doctor and I do not pretend to be one. Um, I feel like the physicians have that covered and they're confident in it, but what they don't often pay enough attention to is the actual economics. And the answer is not always phase one is cash pay, don't worry about it. You know, retail and then we'll figure it out. You know what, that, there's too many people out there who say, okay, it's retail medicine. Already that's gonna get much more competitive and you're gonna drive down the prices and you need that kind of fuel uh, to run your business. Look, whether or not a doctor patient, uh, an in-person exam is required, yes, that's important. Yes, we survey all 50 states, but that's just the tip of the iceberg because what you are fundamentally doing is you're involved in the healthcare industry. And there, there, there are a bunch of rules beyond in-person exams that come into play on the federal level, the state level, and yes, international. You know, we work with a number of AMCs who have U.S. to abroad arrangements. And there are U.S. laws that apply. They absolutely do apply. And they're right here. How you procure those contracts, how you interface, how you do the arrangements, um, even tax implications. A couple, one that I'd really like to touch on is e-commerce. Okay, we saw a lawsuit earlier in the spring filed by a Silicon Valley based uh, class action plaintiffs firm that all they do all day long is just file privacy. Uh, actions against various tech companies. And it was filed against uh, a large telehealth uh, a telehealth provider, and um, not predicated on a breach, just predicated on a violation of privacy expectations, right? And filed in Florida, motion to dismiss, the company filed a motion to dismiss, the plaintiff voluntarily dismissed it with prejudice, the company didn't pay a single dime. Very proud of that because we helped draft those terms of use and the privacy policy, right? So it was actually immediately battle tested. If anything, a take home today is do not copy paste someone else's online privacy policy in terms of use. You might think, oh, this is easy, it's not a big deal. Raise your hand if you're a lawyer. Okay, so you're not lawyers and you don't have to pretend to be one and do not put your company at all the significant risk. It could take like a skilled lawyer of just five hours of time to draft you a privacy policy that is in fact tailored to your actual privacy practices. This is a huge area for telehealth service providers. The FTC is absolutely looking uh, toward it. You see it with um, 
basically really aggressive or grabby privacy policies that say as a condition or term of use of using our website, we can do whatever we want with your, with your privacy and your information. It's not a HIPAA issue. It's just a privacy consumer rights issue. Be aware. Telehealth and payment rules. So here's some of the, like the squirrely things that I see particularly under Medicare that uh, providers want to know. So is the service covered, non-covered, or covered but not separately payable, which is such a nefarious kind of a concept. And the speaker from Noridian did a really good job. She used the term provider liable or patient liable. That is Medicare slang for can you bill the patient even if you can't bill Medicare. So you have a telehealth service, and if it meets all the five elements uh, under the Social Security Act, it's covered. means you bill Medicare. Right? You have to bill Medicare if you participate. It's called a mandatory claim submission rule. That's all hunky-dory. Everybody wants to get paid by third parties. If it's non-covered, right, so the patient's not in a qualifying originating site, that means it's a non-covered service, and you may bill the patient. And you do not use an ABN at all. You're not supposed to use an ABN. ABNs are not to be used if the service is statutory non-covered. It's a service Medicare will never pay for. You only use an ABN if Medicare might not pay for it in that situation. So what do you do? Just your own self-pay agreement. A short form agreement, it's a non-covered service, the patient agrees to pay. Basically a contract. You know, will you paint my house? I'll charge you 3000 Yeah, I'll pay you. It solves a lot of problems. But the covered but not separately payable, what does that mean? That means that Medicare or CMS thinks it's simply because they pay you for other services that if you provide this one, you are not going to get separate reimbursement, nor can you charge the patient. Okay? It is a very difficult concept to wrap your head around, especially if you feel like you should get uh, fair pay for fair work. Here's how it would be applied. Patient uh, goes, see, goes to see Milton for an in-person exam. E&M bills uh, Medicare for that, gets paid. A couple days later, the patient uh, messages you on your app, okay, or telephones you. Says, I have a, a follow-up question, I, just to get clarity. Normally, it might just be like a two-minute kind of a thing. That is part and parcel. It's, the language is integrally related to the covered E&M service, okay? Well, what if we get into the area of a true standalone async? All these hospital and health systems um, promoting their e-consult services. You know, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, uh, totally async, an independent discrete medical event. That's considered a non-face-to-face -face service under the CPT code books. And that is questionable as to whether or not CMS would consider that part and parcel or integrally related to the other covered ENMs. It is uh, going to be an issue that I guarantee we will see more of in the coming years. Overseas providers, right? Oh, this is great. We'll have a radiology company. They'll be based in Israel or they'll be based in Australia. They're 40% cheaper than the U.S. market. Uh, they're board certified and licensed. You know, what's the downside? The downside is there's a rule under Medicare and Medicaid across the board that disallows coverage for offshoring. So if you, you're a hospital or health system and you cut, or an entrepreneur and you want to build a radiology group based on an overseas location, or you want to have some of your providers in your network reside overseas, um, part-time or full-time, those services are not covered under Medicare. And if you bill for those services and Medicare pays, they find out, they'll come at you for overpayments and possible false claims act liability. We have two different clients right now who came to us because they had that very issue. Okay? It is a real issue. You can uh, charge beneficiaries out of pocket for a non-covered service. Uh, I already raised that question about interpretive studies. You can use uh, telemedicine for emergency services under EMTALA. There is a difference, though, between conditions of payment, which is what Medicare will and will not pay, and participation, which is what you can and cannot do. Let's talk about a couple of real-world applications. Do we have anybody from Mayo here? No? Okay. Well, that, you know, uh, they're doing a phenomenal job with um, becoming a center for destination medicine. I feel privileged to be able to work with them on a number of their telehealth, telemedicine issues. And this is true. You know, what we're going to see is a further consolidation of expertise and patient awareness. Um, the patients will be going to places like Mayo, MD Anderson, uh, Johns Hopkins, right? And they will only grow bigger if they use telemedicine and online opinions to grow their market share. You will have a brain drain from your local hospitals and cancer centers because all the young up-and-coming doctors who want to work on exciting, complex stuff will go to the place where all the patients are. So it's not just a patient care thing, but it's a business decision as well. 
This you can take a look at it, but it's basically the life cycle of how you would use an online specialty consult or a second opinion program and turn it into destination medicine, which is your ultimate ROI on those services. Here, let's say you're a hospital and you want to build a statewide telemedicine network. You need to be aware that your money or your opportunities are not unilateral or unidirectional in flow, right? So let's say this is a telestroke example and you want to set up a statewide telestroke network. You're in the middle, you're the academic medical center. These are all rural or uh, critical access hospitals around the circle. You're delivering, you're exporting your telestroke neuro expertise to them. They love it because their patients in their area are stabilized. That's one way to do your business. But what about the cross-referral opportunity? Post-stabilization, after they're confident in the, in the responsiveness and the quality of the care you're providing, that they could transfer those patients back to your AMC for post-stabilization inpatient care, which um, has high dollar value. And that could be quite attractive uh, for a variety of reasons. You need to think about the different facets and the reasons of these services. Not always is telemedicine the end in and of itself for these uh, broader thinking arrangements. It may just be a facet or a tool or the worm on the hook. Right? Particularly if you're trying to attract international patients abroad, that initial opinion might just be the worm on the hook. So let's say you're an entrepreneur, you want to do a direct-to-consumer service, okay? So that's you in the middle. You want to find something that's niche, right? You, certainly you could try to replicate what Teladoc um, is already doing. Or you could say, you know what, I want to find one like, specific type of um, problem. You know, let's say it's like a reproductive issue, or let's say it's like a men's sexual health issue, right? That people might feel a little embarrassed to talk about publicly or talk to their doctor, but they will absolutely Google their symptoms like obsessively and try to find you know, what their own self-diagnosis is. If your telemedicine company is like the pop-up, uh, hit for the SEO or SEM and it's an immediate way for high, with a high user experience for them to get access to you, talk to one of your doctors, whether real-time audio, video, or async, huge competitive opportunity for you. And then your compensation methodology, you could do a fee-for-service based fee or you could do a subscription based model, but you need to think about what is the actual nature, what is the aspect of this service uh, that I'm providing? And is it more of a one-off or is it better to be a recurring fee or some sort of hybridization? Because again, in a direct-to-consumer play, you are essentially engaging in retail medicine. And so people will, ha they do have an appetite to speak with their, doll with, uh, with their own pocketbook, but you have to think about the competitive aspects and the differentiating elements as well. Finally, if you are a pure subscription model, let's say, hey, I'm going to take care of all your family's health care services via telehealth for 99 bucks a month, that's, uh, there's a name for that uh, under some state law. Does anyone know? What's that? Yeah, DPC, but what, what's the other name for it? I'm going to give you a pair of socks too, but I think you already have some. <laughs> Insurance, right? You pay a premium every month in exchange for a set of services. So some telehealth providers who have not built out their utilization risk management properly, they're basically in the business of insurance, and that's a real risk. Okay, so raise your hand if you have a telemedicine provider group, you know, you're, or you want to build one, you're an entrepreneur or something, okay? This is the model. If you don't have this, you're already, and you're live, you're not complying with many state laws, okay? There's something called the corporate practice of medicine. You know, I could not create Nate's telemedicine company and directly uh, contract with doctors, you know, because uh, in half the states, the medical group, the provider group, the PC, needs to be wholly owned by licensed physicians. And not just a licensed physician, but about 33 states require that the owner of that medical group be licensed to practice medicine in that actual state, okay? So this is the structure, it's called a friendly PC arrangement. I work in hope and optimism and building things, right? If you were a more negative or nefarious a a attitude, you would call it a captive PC arrangement because that physician owner up there, they say is held captive. There's a bunch of mechanics and there's about maybe half dozen to ten different documents associated with this model, but here's the fundamental structure. It's actually pretty good for telemedicine providers because the orange circle, the PC, that's your, that's your entity that will, a single entity can contract with all of your doctors. So Dr. Jones need only be licensed in one state, but if you have 50, 100 different doctors, collectively, they're covering a whole bunch of states, and then you use your software platform that'll just connect the patient uh, say the location of the patient to the right doctor, and then you're all set for licensing purposes. And as an enterprise, you have the entire United States licensing covered. 
So I hear from a lot of people, licensing is such a burden, licensing is the worst. Yeah, I get it, but the excuse is what? I didn't want to file the paperwork, or I didn't want to just curate a network of providers. You don't have to go it alone. You don't have to have one or two doctors servicing patients across the country. Tap into that kind of expertise and just do it the right way. Look, we, I get calls probably every week from entrepreneurs who have some funding or about to get funding or, or have started their, their setup, even in fact some who have, have a, a variant of a friendly PC model. And it's just wrong. You know, they just didn't do it right. It's really frustrating to have to tell them that or hear their reactions to it. Um, but if you don't do it right in the front end, your investors will likely hire a firm like mine who will pick it apart and say you have to do all this corrective action and you have to go back to all of your contracted clients and with a mea culpa and try to figure it out. Plus, you're not coming in there with your best face forward when you're actually seeking that kind of investor capital. There are bad things that can happen as well if you don't set it up right. Health plans, they can say, you know what? Yeah, we might have half a million dollars in reimbursements that we still owe you. We don't think there's, we think there's something wrong. We don't want to pay you. Let's just uh, file a lawsuit for unfair deceptive trade practices predicated on the idea that your arrangement violates a corporate practice in medicine, holds our participation agreement null and void. We don't have to pay you anything. Health plans are doing that all the time now. So there are risks uh, associated with it. Lastly, here's my contact info. Um, at the bottom, it's healthcarelawtoday.com. So that's my blog. And it has maybe about 100 different telemedicine law articles. So just go there uh, and just Google your state or your issue, and you'll find all these cool articles. And it's not a half answer. You know, I will explain it, but then also include all the links to the primary sources so you can just uh, do it yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. And um, with that, I'll entertain some questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer anything. Yeah, choice of entity flavors varies o over time. Most venture capital firms prefer a corporation. Private equity is fine with LLCs. Either way, it's going to be for your management company, right, the blue dot. The management company is like the teledoc that you invest in. You don't invest in their affiliated medical group for the PC. The PC is usually a professional corporation or a professional association. Some states do allow you to have a, use an LLC as your entity choice for a medical group, but it, not everyone. So what we do is we do like a mega PC that allows your, uh, to be really efficient and streamlined and less expensive, and you can form qualify that mega PC in other states. And so by keeping it as a professional corporation, you maximize your ability to foreign qualify, reduces your operating expenses. Look, I talked to the CEO of this other unnamed telehealth company a couple of years ago, and he was telling me all he did with his firm. And I asked how much he spent on legal fees, and it was a half million dollars, right, just to start. Because they created a separate PC in every single state. Okay, just think of the cost of that, and then what are you going to do? You have Dr. Jones, who's licensed in five states. You're going to have five contracts right, between each of your five, five of those PCs and that doctor, then you're going to issue five 1099s every year. Your accountants are going to love it because the amount of paperwork they have to do is insane. But you can cover the United States and comply with all these corporate practice laws and only have about five PCs total, including Omega, which is your hub. Larry. Um, so this is a fairly specific question, so feel free to get back to me later, but um, basically we're having a debate right now over, l let's say you have a registered dietitian and they're delivering the diabetes prevention program, which is considered a non-medical intervention because it's basically diet and exercise. And now let's say that the patient is in a state that requires dietitian licensure. Now that dietitian is not performing dietetic services as if they were in a hospital, for example. And so the question is, uh, and one other fact is that a trained lifestyle coach can deliver the program that has a high school degree and is not a healthcare provider. So the question is, if a dietitian is delivering the program in a state that requires licensure, but she's not actually acting as a dietitian, does she need licensure in that state? You know, or is it, well, no, she's not really acting as a dietitian. She's a lifestyle coach. And maybe you have some analogies with physicians as well. You're asking for a friend, right? <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Yeah, so we get this question all the time, particularly with mental health services, right? Because that gets a bit blurrier. There's a lot of licensed professional types. If you're holding yourself out to the public as, you know what, we know diabetes or pre-diabetes education, 
you got to own it, okay? It's a part of it is really what does the consumer expect from the service? And if you say, here, you know, these are licensed uh, CDEs or whatever, but they're really just acting as life coaches and your website isn't clear in that regard, that could be a problem. Um, so I would own it or in your website description, just make it clear as to what they do. Maybe the person happens to be um, certified diabetes educator, educator, but in this regard, they're not and, or, and the vice versa. You see that a lot with life coaches as well or even genetic counselors because only about 16 or 19 states license GCs. Thank you very much for all that information. I'm just, I have a very simple question. I'm just curious because I recognize the name of your company. I'm, I'm curious whether or at all you all guys are related to the company Foley Hoac, which is also a legal, comp uh, a legal strategy firm? No, that's a different law firm. Okay. That's yep. not, not even related at all? <laughs> Maybe I'll, like, I don't okay. know, there's well, some marriage along such a strange the way. Name. Yeah, our right, firm is like 175 years old, so I think there could be some, you know, incestuousness. So what if you're an Australian telehealth startup that's looking to expand into the US uh, with investors in the US, um, what would your general advice be in terms of the most lowest risk approach to dealing with this? Would, be, would it be to engage a law firm like yours initially or um, is there a cheaper alternative? Okay, so uh, <laughs> yeah, there's always cheaper alternatives, right? Uh, McDonald's is definitely less expensive than if you go to shop at Whole Foods. Um, but what you're putting in your body is your own choice. Uh, I think, though, that there are, uh, if I had to choose or identify any um, publicly available resources that have really good information, I would say on telehealth in the U.S., my blog. Uh, the other one is um, CCHP, so Center for Connected Health Policy. Uh, they're a federally grant-funded entity. It's really great. They have dropped down stuff now. They're, they're doing their best with their resources and they're very ambitious. So sometimes they may say something that's like, oh, there's an originating site requirement. But this is actually just for the Medi state Medicaid program and not the practice of medicine. So you want to get some of that clarity. The third place would be the American Telemedicine Association. Um, they have some practice guides and a lot of resources there that uh, these gaps analyses that could be helpful as well. But beyond that, you know, um, after you've done some of that homework, and you know, I think a lot of our clients are very smart people, so they do a lot of it themselves, uh, then you may want to speak with legal counsel that you feel comfortable with, right? Thank you for your uh, info. This is very informative. Uh, two questions. Uh, I have my own telemedicine company, so you're talking about overseas. I go overseas a lot. Is it not good to do a telemedicine consult from the U.S. where you're licensed in the States, but you happen to be on vacation? That's fine. So That's you're licensed, where are you licensed? One of your states? New York and California and Michigan. Okay, great. So uh, New York, right? Yeah, you have a patient in there, but you say, I'm going to go to uh, Paris you know, for a week. Yes. Uh, and you do a consult. That's fine. You have your license in New York. There's nothing stops that. If, however, you're billing Medicare for that service, uh, you cannot bill Medicare. Right? Okay. And you cannot bill Medicaid. And that actually goes to my second question. So in the state of New York, for what I do, um, they say the insurance companies has to cover it, but I only charge cash. Um, if they submit the receipt, I mean, is that, can they be reimbursed? No. Um, it would be a non-covered, so the insurance, the patient's never going to submit, patient can actually submit a claim to Medicare, right, if you don't accept assignment, blah, 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 they're not an insurance company. So there is that potential that the patient would submit it, but you've already told the patient it's a non, I hope, you yeah. have told the patient it's a non-covered service because you're abroad and that the patient cannot submit it to Medicare. If they do so on their own, there's nothing you can do about it, I wouldn't worry about that. The, the biggest factor that this comes into play are really B2B contracts where hospitals would buy um, telehealth services okay. uh, and they're located overseas. I know you know my question, but could you um, speak to a little bit of maybe the gray area or perhaps my mis misinformation from my malpractice career, but so if I have a 19-year-old college student who I have seen since they were 12, say, and now they're in New York um, for the semester and they have an eating disorder or whatever, you know, psychiatric issue I'm prescribing for them, it was my, it is my understanding that since I have a relationship and I'm continuing their medication and they're going to come back at Thanksgiving or Christmas, that I can still continue to see them. Obviously, 
I use my judgment on if it's appropriate or if they you know, are sicker, then I will have them see somebody on campus. But oftentimes, campus student health is uh, not a, available or not an option. Their insurance also may not cover um, non-emergency services outside of the state of California. So I, I, can you maybe just talk a little bit about that? Sure, and I touched on it in the very beginning of the session, but you can contract with your carrier for quite a, quite a few different things, and we've done that with our clients. Um, online second opinions where you're under the peer-to-peer -peer consultation exception, you don't have a license, but they want the carrier to still protect the provider in the event someone sues, right? Um, or a board of medicine takes action. But what you need are a couple things in, in that handout that I gave uh, uh, to Ann and Milton, it'll explain a lot of this. But yes, you need to have a license in the state where the patient is located, period. At the t and it's located at the time of the consult. That is that is the law of the land for licensure. There are about six states that have exceptions for follow-up care. But really, it's technically more of a time limited. I have surgery, I have some treatment, I fly home, and then we're talking about it. But you know, we have a number of telepsych clients that we work with, including some that focus on boarding schools or colleges where the kids go home for the summer and vice versa. You have a pre-existing doctor-patient relationship based in California. You can use that defensively if you ever get in trouble to try to justify or support your actions. But on the face of the law in New York, you would need to have a license to practice medicine in New York to do what you're doing. Your carrier, like I said, may agree under contract to, to cover you, and that's great because they see it as a relatively low risk. Um, but again, if the patient files suit in New York and not California, what's going to happen? If your carrier is licensed in California but not New York, as an insurance company, what's going to happen? If the patient's lawyer files a complaint, even if the patient files suit in California, but if their lawyer files a complaint with the New York Department of Health Board of Medicine for unlicensed practice in New York, what's going to happen? They, you know, they may say, you know what, as a per se, practicing medicine without a license, they may do nothing if your quality of care is fine, but they may write a letter of sanction or warning, and they'll send it to the California Board of Medicine. So those are some of the risk assessment decisions you're certainly entitled to make as a company, but the, the law of the land is different than what the carrier agrees to cover. The nice thing is that we actually have, um, so we were like interviewing some other le uh, law lawyers, they were saying uh, there were no cases had ever been, ever been brought up under that case. That's, that's, that's what they were interpreting and in the case you were mentioning, it was actually okay, even though strictly a definition, if you read the fine print, is like you had to have a license but because there's no case history, and people just in general interpret that's actually is more acceptable. What do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. So you need to also filter this through the risk assessment of reality. And medical boards, just like law, lawsuits, are reactionary. By and large, no one is going to care unless something bad happens. But if something bad happens, then people will care, right? There are cases, in fact, um, interjurisdictional cases where in pathology, there's, you know, there's one in the Ninth Circuit in pathology where the sample was sent to a doctor for interpretation in another state. She was not licensed in the state where the patient was. She, it was on oncological, said, no, it's not melanoma, turned out to be melanoma, then tried to say, oh, this is the peer-to-peer -peer consultation exception to licensure. It didn't fly. And that doctor got hit. So there's not a ton of cases. One reason is the vast majority the vast majority of malpractice claims uh, settle confidentially out of court. So there is not the bolus of case law developed for you to uh, really explore it. Thank you so much. Um, I know you did a bunch of other questions, so Nathan will be around for more socks. And <laughs>